Hello, everyone. It is now two minutes after the hour, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to first thank all of you for joining the Deeper Dive webinar today. Today's topic is on combining the power of Senate and LOSINT to build a full stack WarWAN solution. I am Kevin Niemiller, a solutions architect here at LOSINT. I will be hosting this webinar and helping with Q&A at the end. We also have Dave Schendel, the CTO and COO at Senate. Dave will show us how to onboard a LoRaWAN sensor and gateway, configure the Senate LoRaWAN network server, and then use the LoSent platform to receive, parse, and visualize LoRaWAN data, as well as implement real-time alerts and notifications. Before we go any further, I wanna provide a couple of housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded and the replay will be made available to you in a few ways. After this webinar, we'll send you an email with a link to the replay and the webinar will also be made available on LoSense YouTube page, as well as on our Deeper Dive webpage. Throughout the webinar, you may have questions that you'd like to ask. I would like to point out a couple of key features in the Zoom conference. You can use the Q&A feature or the chat feature to post questions, and I'll be monitoring those throughout the call. At the end of the call, I'll moderate a Q&A session with the posted questions. Let's do a quick review of LoSan in our enterprise IoT platform. LoSent is an application enablement platform. What that means is that LoSent provides enterprises with the building blocks to create their own IoT products. Our platform consists of five key components to help customers achieve that. End user experiences, a visual workflow engine, data visualization, which also includes integration with Jupyter Notebooks, devices and data sources, and edge compute. Our customers and partners utilize these five components to create the robust IoT products they put in front of their end users. LoSAN is a leader in the industrial, telecommunications and smart environment spaces. And we've offered this platform for all sorts of customers, ranging from startups to companies in the Fortune 100. If you're interested in learning more, please reach out and we would be happy to set up some time for a much more in-depth conversation. While LoSAN provides a software foundation for IoT, there are many other components that have to come together to create this IoT application. We've surrounded ourselves with a great ecosystem of partners. This includes strategic partners with whom we share sales and go-to market strategies, solution partners who work with clients to develop end-to-end -end IoT applications, and lastly, technology partners that can provide hardware, connectivity, and other services to complete an IoT solution. Senate is a great example of one of our technology partners. Before I pass the webinar to Dave to walk us through building a full stack LoRaWAN solution using Senate and LoSant, I do wanna cover some of the reasons that we at LoSant enjoy working with the Senate team, with their network server, and why we choose to recommend Senate to our customers. Senate is the largest public LoRaWAN network in North America. They have a qualified device ecosystem and marketplace, which makes it easy to find the correct sensors and gateways that meet the requirements you have for your solution. This also simplifies the process of connecting these devices to the Senate network server. The last point on here really speaks to how great their team is to work with. They were able to quickly get started with LoSent and start building very powerful LoRaWAN solutions, like the LoSent Senate application template that Dave will be walking us through. Speaking of that Senate application template, let me switch tabs now, and if you remember, Anytime you create a new application in LoSent, you can start from a blank application or an application template that we have here. If I scroll down like I just did, you can find the Senate application template. And by clicking on it, we can learn more and also create an application from it. This is a README to help you get started. But as I mentioned, Dave will go through all of this today. I think this is a great time to pass the webinar to you, Dave. Thank you for being here with us today, and we look forward to hearing more about you, Senate, and this complete LoRaWAN solution you're going to walk through. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, as Kevin said, we're, uh, we're very excited to, to share um, some of the, the knowledge that we've gained uh, collaborating with LoSant um, to enable you to uh, create uh, very interesting LoRaWAN solutions uh, very easily. Um, I'm gonna start off just a quick introduction of myself and, and Senate as well. So as Kevin said, I'm the, the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Operations here at Senate. Um, I, in addition to that, that work, I am also heavily engaged as is, are many of the people here at Senate 
uh, with the Laura Alliance, the, um, the nonprofit that uh, curates the specifications for the technology that we're going to be demonstrating today. Um, in the Laura Alliance, uh, I'm also uh, engaged in uh, the board of directors, a member of the board of directors, and chair several committees, work in many committees, as do many of the people here at Senate. So it's a really exciting place to work. Technology is always evolving. We have a great stable uh, platform. The Laura Alliance was actually founded um, in 2015. Uh, and the first specifications were released at that time as well. Those specifications um, and minor revisions of them are still in wide use throughout the ecosystem today. So it's a very stable uh, technology um, that is, uh, makes it very easy to create low power wide area uh, solutions. A little bit about Senate. Um, so uh, Senate's been around for about 10 years. Um, we are a privately held startup company um, and uh, got our start building vertically integrated IoT solutions specifically for tank monitoring. Uh, back in 2014, prior to the Lower Alliance uh, initiatives, we uh, pivoted to a horizontal play to provide uh, core network connectivity for the new technology at the time of, uh, of Laura WAN, uh, as well as providing public network connectivity here in the United States. One of the things that uh, makes the Senate offering very unique is the capability that we have of enabling our customers, as well as the developers who use our platform, to use the public network that we've deployed uh, throughout uh, North America, as well as bring their own gateways to that mix. Um, we call that technology the Senate Low Power Wide Area Virtual Network. Uh, when gateways are brought to that uh, in production services, then we will do rev sharing with those providers who are providing the, the network connectivity as our customers all take advantage of that. So very, very unique uh, capability. In addition to that, very recently over the last couple of months, we've announced connectivity offerings uh, integrated with our platform that can be seamlessly taken advantage of by our customers. And those include access to the Helium network, uh, the Helium network spans over 600,000 uh, gateways at last count, I believe, uh, throughout the world, as well as new connectivity uh, with satellite providers as well. <clears throat> LoRaWAN itself is a really interesting and important connectivity option when you're looking at IoT solutions. So this is a very complementary option to many of the other communications technologies you may be familiar with, like Wi-Fi or cellular, things like that, Bluetooth. Uh, so uh, LoRaWAN really sits in a unique space there. It runs on unlicensed spectrum. Uh, so that means it's available uh, and there are frequency bands around the world that support this. It's available without uh, any additional cost to use that uh, frequency. So that's different than typically what you see for cellular options. Um, and the specification that supports it has recently been introduced as a, um, as a standard in ITU uh, available worldwide. Um, and uh, that, specification and the alliance that, uh, that, um, that creates it are all open for, for anyone to take, um, to take advantage of and to participate in. So again, if you're interested in that space, I strongly encourage you to take a look at, uh, at, at getting engaged in that, in, in that process. Uh, LoRaWAN itself <clears throat> really focuses on uh, primarily battery powered uh, devices that uh, are very low cost and um, are delivering very long range connectivity. Uh, so again, not all of those things are true of all the applications in LoRaWAN, but generally speaking, those are kind of the three key um, uh, fundamentals uh, of what define a good LoRaWAN solution. Um, LoRaWAN is built in security, AES-128 end to end. Um, so from the application on the end device to the application in the cloud is all capable of end to end privacy. That's built into the specification. There is no unsecure or insecure option uh, in the LoRaWAN um, standard. Uh, the, the physical layer uh, technique itself, the LoRa modulation is extremely robust, very, very reliable, and it enables the devices to successfully deliver messages well below the noise floor. Um, and in addition to that, the LoRaWAN uh, technology and the specification, the standard that supports it, the protocol, they enable a wide range of applications, uh, fixed devices, mobile devices, nomadic devices, fully bi-directional communication that includes things like uh, being able to do firmware updates over the air in LoRaWAN. And we can do that in a very unique way that's very, very cost effective and very, very power effective, very different than what you see from any other communication technology out there. Um, and of course, we also have the ability to support geolocation. Um, obviously, this can be done with GPS space trackers and things like that, but there's other interesting techniques that can be applied here that are also very effective. 
Uh, those can include uh, triangulation with signal strength, trilateralization with differential time of arrival. Uh, those techniques can get you down into the tens of meters of accuracy, so really not so bad at all. Um, there are also new silicon solutions out there that provide assisted GPS, Wi-Fi based snooping, Bluetooth based snooping that can all yield very, very, again, cost effective and power effective uh, geolocation solutions for tracking both indoors and outdoors. What we're going to be looking at today, though, uh, is a smart building application. So quick high level uh, summary of that. Um, one of the things that uh, you know, we've noticed, and I'm sure everyone else has over the last several years, uh, experiencing um, you know, all the challenges of the COVID-19 epidemic, a pandemic, has been um, that there are interesting use cases that now are showing up or have shown up that really dovetail into providing a, a safer a workspace, more efficient management of those workspaces. And we're going to just look at a real small segment of that today. So we're looking at a, uh, a solution that will provide uh, indications around the air quality, indications around uh, office space use as well. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some of the details. One of the things that we noticed in our building, and we actually prototyped a complete solution for the building that we're in that does all of these things at, at even more detail than we're going to show you here, but we're really, we're looking at two things specifically that we thought were very important. So one of them was tracking VOCs, volatile organic compounds, as well as CO2 presence in the air. Those are good indicators that align with the proper ventilation of the spaces. So everyone knows now that proper ventilation is one of the key tools to combat uh, COVID spread uh, or really any um, airborne infectious disease spread. Uh, so we're looking at areas of the building where those may be an issue. So maybe we have good uh, ventilation in some areas, poor in other ones. Then we have the, the building management company and rearrange the HVAC system to provide better ventilation all around. The other kind of interesting use case that we're going to be uh, modeling here as well is the, uh, is the building occupancy component. And so we have these sensors deployed all throughout um, our building space. Every single office, all of the shared spaces all have these sensors. And these can be used really for two interesting use cases. So everyone knows that a lot of people have been working from home more and more. We went through periods of time where there are very few people in the offices. So there are two interesting things that come about uh, from that. So one, um, as an employee, if you're in a shared space, maybe you're uncomfortable with that and you wanna make sure nobody else is in that space if you're going to be there. So again, these devices can now show you who's been, you know, which spaces are in use, which ones have been used recently. The second thing it can do is it can, you can work with the building maintenance company to provide guidance around where the cleaning needs to be done. So again, we went through a period with, uh, with COVID where you really wanted to do much deeper cleaning, but most of the space was not being used. So it's a really challenging uh, human factor problem to get the cleaning staff to really be as diligent as they need to be when they see that 90% of the spaces don't have anything that actually even needs to be cleaned. So now we can pinpoint that. We can show them exactly what needs to be cleaned, what offices were used, what shared spaces were used, and they can focus on those areas without wasting their time uh, looking at the spaces that hadn't been used throughout the week. <clears throat> In order to deliver this solution, we're going to really consider three different components. On the right-hand side, you see uh, a, uh, probably not detailed enough, but complex enough for the slide, uh, a vertical a technology stack on what's required in order to deliver an IoT solution. Um, and we're going to look at the three different components here. So at the, the physical layer, as it were, we have MileSite. Uh, MileSite, we're going to be using a, one of their gateways, the UG65 indoor gateway, and one of their sensors, the AM107 uh, environmental sensor. We'll get a, a little bit more detail on that. Next, uh, in the middle, as it were, the connectivity layer, this is going to be running on Senate. So with Senate, that core platform enables really two uh, critical components. One of them is the onboarding and management of the physical network, whether that's our customer, you doing that, or whether that's Senate managing that network, or one of our operator partners uh, running those networks. That enables them to plan the network design, deploy the, the, the gateways, manage, their, manage the connectivity, make sure that it's meeting all the customer needs also onboard the applications themselves. So they onboard devices onto that connectivity platform. And we give them the visibility, our, our customers the visibility then to identify and manage any of the potential RF issues, instrument the devices, and then seamlessly integrate them with an IoT platform uh, and with LoSant uh, in this case. So we're gonna be looking at how we do that integration northbound from Senate to LoSant and what some of the tricks are that we can use in order to make that a little bit more seamless. Uh, and again, 
all of this is, uh, is pretty straightforward. It looks a little complicated on the right side, but you'll see over the next several minutes um, that it really is you know, quite simple. So as I mentioned on the mile site uh, side, we have the sensors. This is a really uh, unique uh, and, and powerful sensor. So we're looking at the AM107, a seven function uh, device uh, that is battery powered, can last years on those batteries deployed uh, and is providing kind of, uh, uh, information sensors around temperature, humidity, uh, CO2 levels, uh, VOC levels. Those two are, are somewhat unique. So you gotta make sure you get a device that specifically is, is measuring those. Uh, barometric pressure, uh, ambient light, and PIR motion. And so we're really using the CO2 and VOC in order to measure the, the air quality specifically. Um, temperature and humidity um, certainly have a comfort index associated with them, which can be important in building management as well. And then we're looking at light and PIR as really the key indicators for, uh, for space occupancy. Uh, this particular sensor has an e-ink uh, display, so it's displaying the current value. So as you're walking around the office, you can see exactly what it is at a glance, as well as communicating those back uh, over the network to the cloud platform so that you can action that um, in a consistent uh, way for the enterprise. The gateway that we're going to be using uh, is the Milesite UG65, a very elegant little gateway. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, quite uh, capable, supports connectivity, backhaul connectivity of uh, Ethernet, uh, PoE powered if desired, uh, Wi-Fi, as well as cellular. So all three are the backhaul connectivity options. Obviously, it has a LoRa WAN front end that supports uh, eight channels of 125 kilohertz plus one 500 kilohertz channel of connectivity. Uh, on the LoRaWAN side. A very robust uh, operating temperature range. Um, and this particular uh, device is also suitable for outdoor installation if it's oriented in the correct direction. So again, very, very capable little, uh, very, uh, little gateway here. We're going to manage and onboard those devices on the Senate developer portal. Um, so this is where you would register uh, on the Senate platform in order to get a free account uh, to couple with the, uh, the Sandbox account that you would get on the LoSant side. Um, <clears throat> On this platform, we will connect uh, and register the LoRaWAN end devices. Uh, we will connect and manage the gateways that are, that are going to be supporting the, that connectivity. And we're going to configure, configure the, stream, uh, the streaming as well. So identifying the notification target, in this case, the LoSant webhook, that we will configure to send the, send the device data to. <clears throat> Quick view, we have two little slides here to look at the solution architecture. On the right-hand side is the physical, uh, physical components. We have the, the sensors, we have the gateway that's connected. Uh, in our case, that's Wi-Fi as we're connecting the gateway via Wi-Fi back into our cloud services. The cloud services uh, that Senate provides are really uh, composed of three different um, uh, components. We have the network server um, in the LoRaWAN space. Everyone's very familiar with this manages the radio access network, uh, manages uh, the performance of the sensors, uh, does dynamic uh, data rate control for performance optimization, battery optimization on the end devices. Um, connected to those are two other backend systems. One of those we call the join server. Um, that provides the, um, the security credentials to the network server for those end devices. So it's the root of trust in this little system that we have. Uh, the join server may be hosted by your network operator by Senate. It uh, can also exist outside of the network operator as a third, a distinct third party application for even improved separation of functions from a security perspective. And then finally, we have the application server. So the application server is instanced per connection to the northbound IoT uh, platform. Uh, so we have an IoT application server instance here that's representing the, the communication to the LoSAMP platform. The encryption and decryption at the LoRaWAN side is done at that application server. Um, and again, like the join server, that's something that can be externalized outside of the network operator uh, domain uh, for enhanced end-to-end uh, -end, uh, application level privacy. So some quick things, uh, again, a slightly simpler view of this. Um, the data flow from the end device sends the LoRaWAN information, again, can receive LoRaWAN traffic as well to and from uh, the gateway. The gateway then uh, builds an encrypted tunnel to the Senate core network. The LoRaWAN traffic still remains encrypted over that tunnel and is delivered uh, inside of the secure tunnel to the LoRaWAN, uh, to the Senate core network. The Senate core network makes any device provisioning um, configuration uh, optimizations from the RF perspective at that point and can send downlink commands to the device to optimize it. It then decrypts the LoRaWAN message 
and creates uh, another message uh, to the LOSANT webhook. Uh, again, that's going to be secured in this case, so a, a secure tunnel from Senate to LOSANT to deliver that, deliver that information to the IT platform where the binary payloads can be decoded, the information can be stored, and it can be represented um, you know, to the end customer as meaningful, as meaningful data. So what do you need in order to get started? And we'll walk you through all of these uh, with the exception of the first one. So uh, assuming that you've created your LoSant Sandbox account, so you'll need to have a, a LoSant Sandbox account. Um, the, the template README, as, uh, as Kevin just showed you earlier, contains all of these instructions as well. Um, so follow those instructions. The next step is going to be create um, a Senate developer uh, portal account, uh, and I'll show you how to do that. And then once you're in your Senate developer portal account, you're going to uh, configure and register the MileSite a gateway. In this case, we'll show you the MileSite gateway. We're going to register the MileSite device, um, and then we are going to configuration the northbound notification target to deliver uh, messages from Senate to the LoSAMP webhook. <clears throat> so with that, we're going to break away from the slides for a moment and move over to, um, to, the, uh, to the live demo. So as we mentioned, this is the Senate um, uh, developer portal login. Uh, portal.seneco.io. Uh, you can create a new account here. Again, there's no charge for that. It comes with um, access to a handful of devices and gateways that you can register. If we log in here, um, you would be presented with a more or less a blank screen. We already have these two registered here, but I want to show you uh, real briefly how we would go through the registration of first the gateway and then, and then the end device. Um, on the gateway side, we're going to take a quick view here um, of the, uh, the local login account, admin account on the MileSite gateway. So this is connecting to the MileSite gateway over its local area network interface. Um, and we're gonna look at a, at a couple of things here specifically. So what we're, what's most important is the packet forwarder side. And the packet forwarder side, um, we have it already configured here. We're going to use the uh, Semtech basic station configuration. Um, but if we were to quickly walk you through that, um, it is still the Semtech uh, basic station type. We're going to use a custom uh, packet forwarder uh, registration here. Um, and if I can uh, bring you to the Senate documentation. Senate documentation walks you through exactly what's required in order to do this. So we're going to grab the URL that we would have uh, displayed here, enter that uh, here, and we would save that. Um, that is um, the, the key component that is uh, required. So once that's saved, there's only one additional thing that needs to be configured, which is the, um, the certificate uh, file. So that certificate file, again, can be downloaded from Senate here, downloaded the TLS certificate, and uh, imported into the gateway. At that point now, the gateway will be making a secure connection to the Senate uh, core network. And that's all that's required on, on the gateway side. Um, <clears throat> Let me just uh, some of these guys out here. Uh, if we were to actually register the gateway by hand, uh, again, this is what you would do. So after you configure the gateway, ready to point at Senate, you really the order doesn't matter too much. We're going to quickly enter a few a few, uh, a few items here. Um, <clears throat> in this case, we would actually be selecting um, Semtech Basic Station uh, as the uh, type. Um, we would be entering the manufacturer serial number and EUI that were present uh, here in the gateway configuration as well. <clears throat> and at that point, we're ready to register. We do uh, want to make sure that the channels match the channels that are configured in the gateway, and then we are, we're off to the races uh, on the gateway side. Likewise, on the device side, uh, very simple uh, methodology here. So uh, when you are sent the device on the back of the device, there's a QR code. That QR code will contain the relevant information, most specifically the device UI. Uh, in the case of these devices, you're going to also uh, specify uh, some additional information. Uh, <clears throat> if I can uh, type. <clears throat> type AM 107 in there. Um, and now we would configure the keys the join EUI that came from the device manufacturer and the key that came from the device manufacturer, registering the device, now you're ready to go. Everything's gonna start, start working. Um, if we look at the, on the Senate portal side, if we look at the gateway, uh, the gateway information, we can show you here um, for the gateway, uh, all of the transactions that are being received by that gateway, um, 
it's going to show you uh, the information that's coming back through. And actually, sorry, this is not the gateway. That's the device. I clicked the wrong one. Let me grab the device, uh, gateway. Um, <clears throat> on the gateway side, showing all the transactions that come in from the gateway, the encrypted payloads that are there. Um, obviously, from a LoRaWAN perspective, this is going to be receiving all kinds of different traffic. Some of it's yours, some of it's not. Uh, the traffic that's not yours, you know, it's not going to be decrypted for you. So, um, but this gives you the, the performance of that gateway. We can look at some basic statistics for devices and transactions that have been received, uh, transactions that have been filtered as well. On the device detail side, um, we're going to be able to now see the details. This is the actual unencrypted payload that we're going to be sending up the webhook to Losant. Um, we'll get into what's done with that as well. The different kinds of messages, uplinks, downlinks, join requests, those sorts of things will all be displayed here. RF information, a little chart describing some of the RF information with different uh, parameters that we can look at um, as well, uh, and a summary of all of the information that's going on. Now, when it comes to getting the information delivered up into LOSANT, then the next thing that we're going to be doing um, is we're going to be implementing uh, a device target. Uh, which is what's created here. So this device uh, URL is the URL that we will have gotten from a uh, Losant when we created a webhook. So we come in here, we add a webhook. Um, <clears throat> we click on this, we've got the URL right here that we can use, so we can click on that. And that gets delivered back to um, the notifier configuration as well. Um, we're gonna use a simple HTTP forward to uh, correspond with that. It is still encrypted, so it is still 443. Um, there's a wide variety of other techniques that could be used as well, MQTT, things like that. Um, but this is the one that uh, the vast majority of customers will also use. Um, we can look at additional fields that we're going to be sending up as well as the payload, the application binary payload. And some of these can be very, very valuable. Um, so specifically, a couple of them that we're going to be using in this case, we're going to be using um, the, uh, the device type, so this type field here. Uh, and we're going to be using the tags field. Um, it may also be interesting to get location information delivered, uh, various other uh, kinds of information that can be delivered as a enhanced metadata consumed potentially by your workflows in LoSant. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to be sending the type up. Um, this is something that we consider just a little bit of a secret, uh, you know, inside, inside our handshake. Uh, so our device type here is actually going to be used in the LoSant um, workflow to steer the traffic to the correct decoder. So we could have dozens and dozens of different kinds of devices all flowing through that same webhook and all being processed by a single workflow uh, in the LoSAMP platform. We're going to show you one, uh, but in our, uh, in our uh, large demo implementations, we have literally dozens and dozens of different devices that are all being processed by that and parsed correctly and then delivered to different functions. So we will, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in just, uh, just a second here. All right, so we started with the webhook. Of course, uh, the next component that uh, we wanna look at is the workflow that is going to process the data that's delivered to that webhook. So here we have the AM107 uh, webhook uh, input uh, node. We're going to be coming through that. Uh, a couple of things that are, uh, again, I wanna highlight in the workflow. I won't go through every single detail here. Uh, one of them is that we're going to automatically create the device shadow in Losant on the basis of it being received uh, from, you know, from Senate uh, to that webhook. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to look up the device. Um, we're going to match it based upon the device EUI, which is the global unique 64-bit identifier that's defined as the, the device identifier in LoRaWAN. Um, if uh, we're going to extract that information we just talked about. So uh, we can look here. We're going to use a little function to extract um, some device type information, um, and we're going to store that uh, on, the, on the payload. Um, we're going to switch here based upon that device type that we decoded um, out, of the, um, out of the input payload. So we're gonna, we have a real simple switch here. Again, we've, we've got some that have dozens and dozens of devices. We've got one, which is our AM107. Uh, and based on receiving that AM107, now we're going to come over, create a device, um, so we're going to you know, make sure that we don't have a device already uh, in the system. If we don't, we're going to create it. We're going to create it using a, a recipe that's included with a template that has all of the information associated with that AM107, all the attributes, some important tags that are going to be there. Some of those tags will be influenced um, by, the, uh, creation, uh, by the creation event itself. 
<clears throat> if we already have a device, uh, a, a shadow created, we're going to skip that step and go right to the AM107 decoder. Uh, so the AM107 decoder is a custom node. Um, and that custom node, oh, sorry, that's not my custom node. I'll click over to my custom node. Um, <clears throat> A custom node is really going to do one very important component. And before I get to that, I'm going to flip back to the slides for just one minute uh, to show you uh, how we would create a decoder. Um, so LoRaWAN is a very, very efficient uh, 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 communications mechanism, very, very low bit rate. Consequence of that is almost all data moved over LoRaWAN is in a packed binary format. <clears throat> um, there are certainly techniques that some, uh, some uh, implementers use, uh, protobufs and various things like this. Uh, in this case, this is a variant of a, a well-known um, uh, encoding mechanism. Uh, it's not completely, uh, it's not completely st standard, so it's customized a bit by the, by the folks at Milesite, um, but it's very typical. So we have one byte that describes um, the channel um, so that you might have a device, for example, that has three temperature sensors on it. So you would have channel one, two, and three, and then a byte that describes the type of sensor. So in this case, um, we're looking at a channel uh, three, 67 is our type, which is the temperature. And then we have uh, a number of bytes that represent the, the data uh, uh, coming from that temperature. In the, uh, in, the, um, in the documentation for Milesite, they will describe this to you as we have on the left-hand side here. Here's a channel, here's our temperature, and it's a 16-bit a integer, and it's little n being encoded. It's encoded um, as, uh, as a number in tenths of a degree Celsius. Um, and so that's what we have over here is a little code snippet that's just kind of making sure we have everything we need. There's our channel, channel number three. There's our uh, sensor type, um, it's the um, uh, temperature reading. And here we are, we're gonna read into our temperature attribute. We're going to do a, a 16 bit little ending read of two bytes uh, are at location two. And we are going to divide that by 10 to get um, actual degrees centigrade. <clears throat> and that, if we flip back here, is what is exactly is in our, uh, our decoder function. So in addition to the temperature, which is this snippet right here. Uh, we're also decoding all of the other information that's coming there. So the status of the battery, relative humidity, uh, the light levels, infrared light, motion counters, CO2 levels, VOC, pressure, everything else is coming back through that and being stored on, um, uh, being stored on, the, uh, on, on, uh, on the workflow payload. And if I pop back, uh, I think I didn't pop back far enough. Um, and we catch a few, a few more of these. I'll show you kind of live what, what that looks like through there. As those are being processed, um, <clears throat> what we're going to be seeing, so that gets stored in our device. This is the device shadow as it's represented here. And you can see that we have um, a running representation of the data that's coming through from the end device after it's gone through that decoder. So here's our CO2 level. Here's uh, infrared level, light level, motion count, pressure, so on and so forth. Here's the original payload, binary payload that was sent up from Senate and delivered there. We have a few other things that we use to calculate, uh, can use to calculate some other important information, specifically the sequence number and the join ID that we use to identify um, you know, if messages were dropped over the air coming up to the system or not. <clears throat> All right. So that really kind of wraps up um, the, uh, the component. I guess the, um, the final thing I can, I can say here is we will, um, when we were looking at the workflow after we do the, the AM107 decoder, we actually do a basic decoding of a bunch of information that always comes up from Senate. That's that, uh, the, the tags fields, the, the RSSI, SNR, those sorts of things. And then ultimately we store that information on the device. That's what the, that uh, device state uh, attribute node is doing right there. So this now is processing all the data, bringing everything through. What does that look like? So we can now represent that to uh, the end customer, the building management staff, or the, the employee who's going to uh, see if that room is a good room to, uh, to book for uh, tomorrow's uh, meeting. They can come in and look at information, current temperature. This is in my office right now, and I am feeling a little flush, so it's a little bit warm in here, uh, but not, not overly bad. Um, we can look at the overall um, uh, volatile organic compounds, CO2 levels. Um, 
this spike here is clearly me on the phone uh, you know, earlier today, uh, speaking in front of it um, in CO2 levels. I see a, you know, reasonable levels in all of these. We would be concerned uh, with CO2 levels that were you know, above seven, 800 um, parts per million. Um, and we would be concerned about VOC levels that were in excess of uh, 1,000 parts per billion, I believe is my parts per uh, correct there. Um, and again, that can then drag and it would drag over here and represent in this widget a uh, color coded of concern there. So if we saw you know, areas that were outside of what we were expecting, that would color code the, color code the widget. We have a representation of the occupancy of the device as well. Um, so I'm sitting right in front of it. So we're very occupied. Um, and, uh, and if we had many devices in this, they could all be represented here, both in our, um, both in our uh, floor plan, as well as in a summary table that listed the devices now, again, where we can, uh, in this case, the link will actually take you directly to, I'll click on it here, see where it brings me. Uh, it'll bring me um, back to, uh, yeah, it'll bring me back to my, my Senate portal, uh, where we will then uh, be able to see, you know, the Senate's, Senate's view of that device. Um, if you had an overall summary with many devices, these links could bring you to the LOSANT detailed dashboard for that specific device as well. Okay, so one of the final things that I wanted to, to show you here today was how we can take uh, and turn uh, all of this information into additional actionable information. So one of the things that we wanted to show was the event system. And so we're looking now at a specific uh, set of attributes or a specific attribute that's coming from that end device. The attribute we're looking at is the motion counter, the motion detection uh, counter. Um, so the end device itself uh, can, um, uh, can debounce that. So you don't get continuous uh, motion counts. We have defeated that for this device so that it's always kind of reporting information. Um, <clears throat> We can also debounce that in, uh, in Losant as well. And we're in fact doing that right now. Um, so what we have here is we have a device, a device state monitor. So this is monitoring uh, a change to that motion count. So when we get a change to the motion count, so we're looking at you know, our devices, our AM107 devices, and we're looking for this specific attribute, the motion count attribute. When we get a, a trigger on that, um, we're going to come in and we're going to uh, look and a, make sure motion was really detected. And then we're going to come in, we're going to create an, an event. And this event will be used to send an email uh, to, for example, the cleaning staff uh, to say, hey, you know what, this room got used, you should clean it tomorrow morning or, or clean it tonight. Um, but we don't want to send that continuously. So we're going to see if the event already exists. So we're going to look that event up. Uh, we're going to look that event up by the device ID that was that was that had the event, and by the specific event type that we're using. So this is a motion event. Um, if the device, if the event does not exist, we're then going to go ahead and create a new event for that, identifying the device and the um, and the event type, the motion uh, the motion event type, and we're going to then send an email um, <clears throat> to a few of us. Uh, to let us know that that space has been, uh, you know, that space has been occupied, uh, that motion detected there. If the event already does exist, instead of doing that, we're just going to increment the count on that event so that we can keep track of how many times it was used. Maybe we have another threshold that we would use that would say, oh, once we got to this level, you know, it's an emergency. Someone's got to go in and clean that. So you might use this in a restroom, for example, like, okay, you know, it's great, you know, got used, we'll clean it, you know, clean it tonight or it's been used a hundred times, someone needs to go clean it right now and reset that counter. Um, and they can go and do that, reset that counter in this event list here. So if we click on this, uh, this event, we'll get information, um, a, a direct link to the device so we can get to the, the, the device uh, detail information. We can come in and see what the characteristics were of, um, you know, of the payload that caused the, 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 motion, the event to get created. And you can see as the event has continued to occur, we're incrementing um, our, our detection count time. Um, if we wanted to acknowledge this, restart the entire process all over again, we can simply come in here, acknowledge that, uh, acknowledge that event, and, uh, and then it will be recreated uh, the next time that motion event comes through. So I think um, I've hit all of the, uh, the high points uh, of, the, of the demo that I was looking for. Just to recap real quickly, um, what we were you know, attempting to do was show you a really uh, easy to implement, just a couple of moving pieces 
uh, solution to quickly get gateways and devices connected both to Senate to use LoRaWAN as well as flowing data through the LoSAMP platform um, and doing all of the interesting work of decoding, displaying that, moving that on. So this is a great kind of Kickstarter for that. You can add different kinds of devices, different kinds of gateways on the Senate side, add your own decoders, expand that as you like from the template that, uh, that has been uh, just recently published. Um, and you know, at larger scale, you can take these ideas and continue to work on them uh, and invest in them in order to create you know, fully scalable um, production quality solutions using both, uh, both Senate and Los Angeles. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you all. And, uh, and maybe Kevin, it's time to, uh, to move to uh, Q&A. That was excellent, Dave. Thank you very much for that great walkthrough on building a complete LoRaWAN solution. Before we jump into q and I did want to cover a couple of other quick topics. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. So first off, we often hear from our customers about the great experience they have working in the LoSAN platform. If you are one of these people, we would love for you to write a review on Captera and G2 to help other developers that are looking for a great IoT platform experience. Next, I want to mention a save the date. LoSAN will be attending RealCom on June 15th and 16th in Orlando, Florida. If you will be there as well, we would love to meet you. So please find us there or reach out to us ahead of time to set up a meeting. We have a couple of additional resources on the slide to help you get started with your IoT product. These include a deeper dive on incorporating BACnet into your smart environment, a template library to help you with smart or with real-time alerting, a huddle room monitoring application template, that provides you with a dashboard and end user experience to get up and running quickly, and documentation on the dashboard image overlay block that can be used with floor plans for buildings. Finally, I want to mention a couple of great resources that we provide to help you build your IoT product on the LoSAN platform. LoSAN University is a great place to get started, and our thorough documentation and active forums are fantastic tools to help. For reference on applications we have built, check out replays of our past deeper dives. And if you're ready to start building, try out one of our hands-on tutorials. The hands-on tutorials will walk you through building different parts of your IoT solution or IoT product, such as reporting device state over MQTT or configuring single sign-on, all the way to building an end user experience. Okay, Dave, let's get into some questions now. So the first question I have is gonna be for you. We saw the sensor that you're using displaying degree C. This was at the very beginning of your presentation. Can it also display Fahrenheit as well? Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So the um, there's there's two uh, there's maybe three different ways to answer that question. So on the physical device itself, the AM107, you can configure that screen to display in, in Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, in terms of what how the data is delivered um, uh, from the device over the over the network, that is always going to be intensive degrees Celsius. Um, if you want it in Fahrenheit, you have two choices there. Once you get to processing the data in, in Losant, you can either change the decoder function to convert it directly into Fahrenheit as you're decoding the binary payload. Or what we do um, is we actually use um, the uh, uh, typically the handlebar helpers that are present in the, the Losant UI display blocks to do a, a, a runtime conversion, a display time conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit if that's more convenient for your audience. Great, thank you. So this next question I'll go ahead and take, and it says, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but does MileSite device support the BACnet protocol? So I do not believe the MileSite device supports BACnet, but I do wanna mention that the LoSite platform does support BACnet. So you could use the AM107 and any other LoRaWAN sensors throughout your building and send that data to the Senate network server and then to LoSant. From there, LoSant can integrate with your BACnet system to provide orchestration with other systems and equipment in your building. Okay, another one for you, Dave. Is it possible to send a downlink message from LoSant through the Senate network server to the end device to do things like updating a configuration setting of the end device or sending a command to that end device? Absolutely. So um, we, we haven't demonstrated that in this, in, in, in this uh, template, but we certainly have implemented that in ours. And there's two use cases that um, we find kind of particularly interesting. Uh, so one of them is some of these sensors, um, you know, are you know, fairly complex and they can be configured in many, many different ways. You know, literally 
dozens of different configuration options, which can be really difficult to do, you know, in a kind of a binary translation uh, way. So what we've done is we create uh, a template, uh, a, a dashboard in Losant that contains all the configuration variables along with a selection that you use to identify the device. So the device uh, ID or the device name in this case, that WI or can even be a, a representation of a many different devices, like all of the MileSite AM107 devices. Um, and when the when you press the button in that dashboard, it then executes a workflow that goes in and sends downlink messages via API from Losant to Senate. Senate then sends them through all the appropriate gateways to all the different devices that you're trying to configure to get them to uh, you know very easily do a mass you know reconfiguration of a whole set of devices all at once. So very powerful. The other use case that's also very important is when we talk about alarm systems. So when we're working about something that is you know, critical, critically important to be delivered, uh, LoRaWAN is not a guaranteed delivery protocol. So it's, it's a best effort protocol. So if you want guaranteed delivery, that's a coordination between what the, the device does and what your application in LoSant is doing. Um, and so what we do in that case is we actually have a handler. So when it is received, we get an alarm condition from a device. So say there was a tamper detection on a, you know, on a, on a door or something like that. That tamper detection would go off on the device. The device would start sending the alarm up to Losant. Um, as we process that in Losant, we would detect that an alarm condition has occurred and we would send a confirmation back down to the device that would confirm two things, the kind of alarm that we are clearing and a sequence counter that identifies the device exactly which alarm we are clearing. So that avoids these hidden state problems where your backend and your device can get out of, out of sync. So again, very, very powerful. Thank you, Dave. I'll take this next one. Does this solution support a way to restrict certain access depending on who is logging into the application and interacting with that data? So at the beginning of the presentation, I went over five main components of the Losem platform, and one of them was end user experiences, which allows you to build one multi-tenant application that allows all of your customers to log in and only see the data they have access to. So Losem helps with that access control where you can build any type of hierarchy to include each type of end user you have at different levels within that model. So for example, with smart environment, you might have a corporate engineer or building management company able to see all buildings or all campuses, and then a facilities manager who has access to only one building or one campus. Okay, Dave, we got a couple more. This one will be for you. How often is your device sending data and what are the typical intervals for sending data that you see when using LoRaWAN with these low power battery operated sensors? Yeah, great question. So uh, for the demo, for the demonstration here, we actually have this device to be con configured to be sending um, uh, messages very frequently. Um, it's sending them every couple of, like every five minutes and it's sending them every time there's a motion which is right next to me, so it's all the time. That's not a typical LoRaWAN use case. Um, and over the last couple of weeks, you know, we've probably used a quarter of the battery on that device doing something like that. Typically speaking, what we're, what we're uh, expecting to see with LoRaWAN um, kinds of applications, devices, is those devices are usually sending, you know, no more frequently than, you know, once every five minutes, 15 minutes. Typically, it's probably once an hour. Some of the use cases are once every couple of hours, even once a day. Some are even longer than that, once every couple of weeks that it would send. So keep in mind, we can do this LoRaWAN uh, uh, communication over satellite networks and things like that as well. So in some of those use cases, it really is a long period between, between the uplinks. In order to be battery efficient, again, you want to be keeping an eye on, on, on those, those elements as well. Um, certainly, if you have a really high bandwidth application, there's other communication technologies that are probably more well suited than LoRaWAN, Wi-Fi, uh, you know, LTE, you know, various things like that. <clears throat> okay, so the next question I'll take it says, could you explain reasons why to go MQTT instead of HTTP and vice versa for smart buildings? Which is the preferred protocol? So what I'll say is, are both are are great protocols to use. In the case of uh, LoRaWAN, like we're talking today. Dave mentioned a lot of great reasons to use LoRaWAN, like low cost, low power, and long distance. It is a great way to securely send data to the cloud, as well as send commands down to the device securely using HTTP. And then once it, or to, send, to, to use that over the, the LoRa network. So once the data gets to the Senate network server, we can get that data to LoSant, which is a cloud-to-cloud -cloud connection using HTTP and a webhook. 
if you need to connect to some other equipment, like, like Dave was mentioning, there's some other ways to get around that using uh, like 4G and, and cellular technologies like that. Uh, another way is to use something like the LoSAN Gateway Edge Agent, and that acts as a MQTT client that you can install on your gateway. And since it's an MQTT client, it's an, actually an outbound connection out of your building to the LoSAN platform, which allows bi-directional data to flow securely between your building and the cloud. Okay, so I'll, I'll take this next one too. In the case of a customer would like to do integration with 3D map of buildings with different sensors showing CO2 or temperature levels, as well as occupancy, does it integrate with the LoSAN platform? Assuming 3D mapping are collected via another tool like CAD or drone mapping. So the LoSAN platform, like I just mentioned, you can use end user experiences and you can really use any library that you want in that end user experience in order to use those 3D mapping libraries that we talked about. In our dashboard, we also have a custom HTML block, which allows you to use libraries directly in that. Okay, Dave, we have a question about uh, like an alarm hub. So you were talking about alarm systems before. So could we do a complete alarm system based on LoRaWAN from the LoSAN platform? Things like an alarm hub, motion detector, door, open close sensors, smoke sensors, leak detection, siren, all through LoRa. So the answer is absolutely. Um, and again, we've we've implemented some of those. We we did a, a demonstration for a, an electric utility around electrical utility pole monitoring. So monitoring impacts and poles being knocked over, and uh, you know temperature of the um, uh, of the uh, temperature warnings for the um, uh, transformer. So all of those generate alarms. Um, for different use cases, those can all are all represented back into a single dashboard, uh, our single set of dashboards really uh, in LoSAN. So what we're looking at there is um, an overall um, alarm dashboard where you're looking at issues that may be coming in um, and then digging into specific, um, in what we would do in a case like this is that particular pole is actually a, uh, a system device in Losant that has several other device shadows underneath it that are rep representing the, the multiple sensors that are monitoring it. And from there, you would see exactly, you know, what needs to be triaged in order to, to, uh, to, 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 to fix that, that scenario. And again, the important thing from a functional perspective on the alarm handling is, is that it's really important to tie that reception of the alarm in the Losant platform back into acknowledging the alarm on the end device you know, through the through the API call from Losant to Senate, Senate then delivers it, you know, over the LoRaWAN network to the end device. Okay, great. This next one's a quick one since I kind of already mentioned it. Is there a method to overlay maps on the dashboard or other geolocation data? So the Losant platform comes with many different blocks to help you get up and running with your data quickly. Some of those are the image overlay block to do building floor plans. There's other ones that allow you to use GPS maps, things like that, and you can overlay data on the things like that. And like I mentioned, we have that custom HTML block where you can really use any library you want and really build any block that you want. Okay, next one for you, Dave. Does anything need to change with this template and solution if the sensor is connected to a helium miner? So the short answer is no, um, that uh, the Helium network is, um, is supported natively for all of our production customers, including all of our developer, uh, developer portal um, accounts as well. There's one slight thing that, that is important to recognize, which is that if the device is going to join our network over Helium, then it needs to be provisioned with credentials from our network. So that meant if you get an off the shelf device, you might need to re reprogram the join EUI in it so that Helium will actually send that traffic to us. That's the only small thing that needs to be done, but otherwise everything will just work. So if you've got a development kit device and you're, you're configuring it with the credentials that we gave you, it'll work just, just seamlessly. You won't even know that there's a difference. Okay. And then the last question here, I think this will be a two-parter. I'll take the first part of it and then I'll let you answer. Can I build a custom device onboarding UI in LoSant that automates the Senate device registration using a Senate API? So in the LoSant platform, you can absolutely build a UI like that. And it's very easy to build a UI like that using our end user experiences, which I mentioned, our dashboarding, and then connect that to really any API. So Dave, I'll let you take over from here to, to let us know if the Senate API is capable of that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's we, we kind of showed you in, in this uh, in this uh, template how um, the device is automatically created in LoSant from API uh, calls from Senate, but the reverse is absolutely you know uh, possible um, and is probably preferred in many production implementations. In which case, the customer probably has the customer is actually deploying the devices probably has um, a a um, uh, a workload that they're using where they are, you know, hanging the device in the wall, scanning the barcode on the app, that then flows into your LoSand application. The information that came from that barcode scan then goes into an API call into Senate that activates the device on Senate so that data now starts to flow from Senate up to up to LoSand. So that's absolutely uh, possible. Maybe that's a good topic for a future, uh, for a future deep dive or a future um, a discussion. You can also do the same thing on the gateway side. So uh, again, if you have customers and your end customers who are, who are hanging gateways in places and you want to simplify the pr procedure for them, you can also use an API call that runs from your, you know, from your, your mobile phone through LoSant, from LoSant down to Senate to go and, and onboard that gateway at that location. Again, really the important uh, element there is to in, convey the, the, the additional metadata that provides context to that 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 location. So the gateway belongs to this customer. It's at this location. It's you know that kind of thing. Same thing on the device. We just put this motion sensor in this office. It's this kind of a sensor. You know it belongs to you know this customer of mine. All of that can be pushed. You know all from the API from the user experience. You know standing in the physical world all the way back through low Santa Senate and then provisioned in our platform. Okay. Thank you for that. So we're coming up to the end of the hour. I think we're gonna go ahead and end the webinar now. I just wanted to go ahead and thank Dave and everyone that joined us today. If you would like to learn more, please check out LoSent by visiting the LoSent website at losent.com or emailing us at hello at losent.com. For Senate, feel free to reach out to Dave on LinkedIn or send an email to info at senateco.com. Thank you again. Thank you.